Well, good morning, and the chair sees a quorum. We'll call the meeting to order. I'd like to start first having the members and including staff introduce themselves. Rich, if you want to start, let's go around this direction, please. My name is Rachel Bibbler. I'm fiscal analyst for the Senate Majority Caucus. State Senator Chris Garten hailing from the Fighting 45th District of Southern Indiana. Representative Bob Cherry from District 53, which is uh, most of Hancock County, Greenfield, and Pendleton in Madison County. Uh, Jordan Cedar, I'm the attorney for the Senate Democratic Caucus. Ben Tooley, fiscal analyst with the House Republicans. Jeff Thompson, State Rep, District 28, and parts of Hendricks, Boone, Montgomery Counties. Ryan Mishler, Senate District 9, North Central Indiana. Chris Ricci, Senate Republican Fiscal Analyst. Zach Jackson, State Budget Director. Joe Havig, Deputy Budget Director. Gregory Porter, House District 96, Indianapolis. Eric Gonzalez, House Democrat Fiscal Analyst. Ed Lenny, I'm from House District 86, which is right next door to Representative Porter's district. Lisa Ackelbert, Deputy Budget Director. Good morning, Fadi Kadura, Senate District 30, north side of Indianapolis. Jessica Harmon, Legislative Services Agency. Thank you. We have the minutes before us. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the minutes as presented. Here. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's right, yeah. yeah. Oh, like, we need a, a motion, I think, again, don't we? Yeah, please, yes. All right, I'll, I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay, is there a second? A second. Second, okay, thank you. Okay. All in favor of the amendments as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Carriage unanimous. We also have before us a proposed agenda, and I know that we do have a couple of changes with regard, or a change with regard to what has been proposed, and it deals with the Secretary of State's presentation. They could not make it here today, and that's, uh, I think, on your packet back towards the very last page. And it would be six, it'd be from four through 18. All of those are Secretary of State and they could not make it today. I would entertain a motion to, uh, to ch change or delete those portions from the agenda that we're gonna have on the table. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the proposed uh, addition or deletion from the agenda? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mo motion carries unanimous. With that then, we'll go ahead to the agencies and we start, I believe, with the Indiana Department of Administration. Matt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Matt Kent with the Department of Administration. The Department of Administration is requesting $12.5 million for the final phase of the exterior renovation of the State House. The first three phases of the renovation focused on the facade and entryways of the four sides of the building, and now that those phases are completed, we turn our attention to the roof line and above to complete this project. The work in this phase will, imp will include copper gutter repair replacement where needed for proper drainage, chimney masonry work, rotunda masonry work and cleaning, some limited window repair, repair and replacement, patching and repair of the roof where needed, and then finally we'll scaffold the, the copper dome and make any necessary repairs and clean the copper. Uh, the work for this is pretty extensive, so we anticipate this taking up to a year to complete. Presentation. Sure. Seeing then, thank you. I believe you also have another project. Um, no, I'm, I stand corrected. I'm, in, yes, you have two. In, in Department of Administration, also have another one. Num number two, thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you. 
Department of Administration is requesting $2.9 million to address Government Center campus safety modernization and upgrades to the current system. IDOA has worked closely with the Indiana State Police, Department of Homeland Security, and the Indiana Office of Technology to conduct a thorough review of our current um, Government Center security system. The review highlighted several areas where our current system were deemed insufficient for present day standards. To address these deficiencies, we will centralize all security monitoring under one umbrella. This will help to create a security network that shares information and collaborates instead of siloing ourselves off into, into separate agencies. We will also add new cameras and replace outdated cameras to better capture activity on our campus. These funds will also purchase new servers to host all the data and maintain backups of that information. Last of all, the new system will also include a mass communication system that has the ability to alert all cell phones on campus of any impending situation that might, that might require everyone's attention. The Emergency Operations Center, the EOC, located in the Government, government Center South will be the new single point for monitoring all of this uh, information on campus. Any questions regarding item number two on the list? Thank you. Okay. Wait, the last project I have is on behalf of the Indiana War Memorial Commission. I'm requesting $2.9 million to continue work on the life and safety upgrades project in the Indiana War Memorial Building. The third phase of this project will continue some of the work from the previous two phases, which includes fire suppression system installation, fire alarms and smoke detection systems, exit signs and emergency lighting throughout the museum and office space of the building. The remainder of these funds will go towards sure. providing proper egress from the building, which includes reactivating and refurbishing the bronze doors of the east exit near the auditorium, reactivating the museum level south exit, sure. and reactivating the bronze doors of the shrine room as exits. Last of all, we'll install a public address system throughout the war memorial to alert visitors in case of emergencies. Any questions regarding item number three on the agenda? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Next is item number four, Indiana Finance Authority, Jim McGough. Head please, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Jim McGough with the Indiana Finance Authority. I'm the Director of Environmental Programs and the Chief Operating Officer. This is my third opportunity to come before you to present the uh, Water Infrastructure Fund. Um, the description in your materials is, is as we've provided in the past, so I won't spend much time there, but I will give you the most current results on the fund. So $60 million has previously been appropriated to the program. $52 million has been awarded to more than 25 borrowers. As of June 30, the remainder of that 60 will be going out into loans here in the next um, two months. Over 32 million or 62% has been awarded to utilities that serve territories of less than 3,200 customers. Our goal, our uh, statutory requirement is 40%, so we're exceeding that by uh, almost 22%. Estimated savings to customers um, that are participating in this program in excess of $20 million. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kodora. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Can you later follow up with me via email to let me know? I, I would like to see the communities that received or that are planning on receiving those. I think we had an extensive debate during session to understand that the applicants in different communities, some communities were growing, they didn't need incentivization of these projects, some communities were struggling. So I just would like to look at the, if, if it's publicly available, not confidential information, to look at the communities that were approved for these grants, if you don't mind. Absolutely, and um, we just did finish our state, our 2023 state fiscal year annual report, so I will um, email you the link That's, to that. I appreciate it, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further questions on item number four? Seeing then, thank you. And I will stay for item number five and invite Sherry Seiwert to join me. Uh, Sherry, uh, joining the Indiana Finance Authority and will be directing uh, this new program that is being funded for the first time. And uh, she'll take lead on the, today's presentation. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Sherry Seiwert. I am delighted to be here. 
Uh, this is a new program. Uh, $50 million uh, is the first amount that's been awarded, and so we've not made any loans yet out of the fund. Currently, we are uh, soliciting feedback from communities around the state, different organizations. Uh, we've talked to several LIDOs, and um, we are in the process of building out the application as well as the guidelines to the project. We will make uh, both of those available, the application will be available in January of 2024, and then uh, we will make uh, funding decisions in the spring. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions regarding item number five? Seeing none, thank you. I believe next we're ready for item number six. Yes. Kristen, okay. My, Michael, go ahead, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, good morning. My name is Brigadier General Mike Grunman, the Assistant Adjutant General Army for the Indian Army National Guard. On behalf of the Adjutant General and our 11,000 soldiers and airmen, it's a pleasure to present my, these uh, <clears throat> items for consideration for you this morning. My first item is uh, a uh, armory boiler replacement uh, at two armories, armories in Hartford City and Lebanon. At a, at a cost of $690,000. These have a federal share as well. Any questions on item number six? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my second and last item is a uh, two roof replacements at Washington and Stout Field in Indianapolis at a cost of $1,071,000. Both of these projects also have a federal share. Any questions on item number seven we have before us for the gentleman? Yeah. Seeing none, thank you. Great, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. I believe next we have is item number eight. Kristen Hanley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Kirsten Haney, CFO for Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Before jumping into this today, I did want to send regards from Director Bortner, who couldn't be here today. He's out teaching at the National Association of State Parks Directors Conference in Lake Tahoe. Uh, we have some monumental items on this agenda today, so he sends his regards and would love to be here, but is grateful for the opportunity. So the first one is uh, our Hardy Lake lift station. We're just requesting additional funding to complete a lift station repair project. This is the main lift station for Hardy Lake State Park and pumps wastewater to the city of Austin. Unfortunately, the park can't operate without this pump. It's led to rental pumps and tanks being brought in to keep the lift operational and Hardy Lake open to visitors. Previously approved funding is allocated for the rehabilitation of the lift station, but we need additional funding to make sure that we are funding those temporary rental solutions. The supply chain issues have really hit us hard on this one, uh, resulting in ongoing expenses that exceeded our original estimates. Without these measures, we'd essentially have to close the park. Any questions on item number eight? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Our next one, we're requesting funding to purchase equipment that will allow the DNR to perform resource management at our forestry properties. So this is a continuation of forest restoration activities undertaken by the division to fulfill its mission in maintaining sustainable forests for current and future generations. The equipment will be utilized for land management, invasive species control, forest restoration, timber stand improvement work. The land managed by the forestry division is kept in a long-term trust for Hoosiers and is actively managed for long-term health by adhering to international standards that we have for sustainability. Thank you. Any questions on item number nine on the agenda? Seeing none, go ahead, please. Our next request is funding to begin the repairs and restoration activity at McCormick's Creek State Park. Our property was hit very, very hard in 2023 from devastating tornadoes. Those storms caused damage to infrastructure, loss of life, and natural amenities. The initial request for funding will go towards the engineering and design, cabin repairs, group camp repairs, comfort station replacements, and other recovery work. The DNR is working towards a completion date of summer 2026 for this. Any questions on item number nine? 
Go ahead, please. And our last request is funding to construct a new state park inn at Potato Creek State Park. Potato Creek State Park is a 3,840-acre property near South Bend, Indiana, with a 327-acre lake that serves as the focal point for this new inn. The inn will have 120 guest rooms, full-service dining room, patio and terrace, and event and conference center. Additional amenities will include a gift shop, activity rooms, 9,000 square foot indoor aquatic center, lake observation deck and boardwalk, playground, 12 courtesy dock boat slips, and parking for 250 vehicles. The construction is expected to begin in spring of 2024. Thank you. Any questions regarding item number 11? It's on the agenda. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next, I believe we have item number 12, Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Devin Burks. I'm with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. And with me, I'd like these gentlemen to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm James Markle. I'm the Executive Director of the Northwest Indiana Law Enforcement Academy. I'm Greg Mance. I'm the Police Chief in Griffith, Indiana, also the Chairman of the NELIA Board. The Indiana Department of Homeland Security, on behalf of the Northwest Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, requests appropriated funding of $5 million for the construction of a law enforcement training facility the training facility will approximately be 25,000 square feet and have the capacity to nearly double the annual uh, graduation count for recruits. Um, the facility will include modern law enforcement training features, such as an auditorium for lectures and a physical training room for fitness standards. The completed facility will help meet the demand for properly trained law enforcement officers within Indiana. Thank you. Any questions regarding item number 12? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I believe next we have the Indiana State Police. Major Williams, I believe. Good morning, Chairman, and uh, to the rest of the distinguished uh, members of the uh, panel. Um, Jerry Williams here on behalf of uh, Superintendent Carter. Uh, I also have accompanying me today is Lieutenant uh, Derek Scott. Uh, Derek Scott is the direct manager of all of our state police access properties across the state of Indiana. If you will please allow me an opportunity, this will be uh, Lieutenant Scott's first opportunity to present as we tr start to transition him into these responsibilities going forward. Uh, he's gonna present the three uh, projects that we have here this morning. Lieutenant. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the board for the opportunity to I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board for letting me present our projects we'd like to try to accomplish. The first one I'd like to talk about is the roof replacement. The Indiana State Police requests $955,000 for a roof replacement at three posts located at Puttonville that has a roof of 27 years for sales, 24 years, Bloomington, 17 years. Each of these roof, roofs are experiencing leaks in several areas and deteriorating to the point that equipment inside these buildings are at risk of water damage. Are there any questions regarding the roof projects? Thank you. Any questions on item number 13? Okay, then go ahead, please, sir. The next project I would like to present to the board, the HVAC Rehabilitation Program. The average life is 30 years. The Indiana State Police requests $1.5 million to proceed with HVAC upgrade at three locations, Peru Post, Sellersburg, and the microwave building at Post 52 in Annapolis. The HVAC system at each of these facilities range in age from 40 to 44 years and are at the end of their useful life. The current HVAC system operates with obsolete controls 
and phased out R22 refrigerant. Any Are questions any? regarding item number 15? I'm sorry, 14. I'm item 14, I stand corrected. Any questions? Yeah. Seeing none, thank you. Go ahead, please, sir. The third project I would like to present our emergency generator replacement. And each one of our generators have a life expectancy of 30 years. The Indiana State Police requests $520,000 to proceed with emergency generator replacement at four locations, Sellersburg, Jasper, Bremen, and Pendleton. The current generators installed at these facilities range in age from 34 to 43 years old and are past their life, useful life. Any questions on item number 15? Seeing none, thank you. On thank the behalf you. of the superintendent, Major Williams, and the Indiana State Police, I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I believe next is item number 16, which is the Indiana Public Safety Commission. Go ahead, please, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I am here on behalf of Kelly Dignan, uh, IPSC Executive Director. Uh, she came down with an illness and didn't want to spread her germs today and so asked me to, to be here in her place. Uh, with me is Venetia Warren. She is our Director of Operations. Uh, we are here today to request a uh, million dollars uh, to replace approximately 95 mobile deployable radios and 66 handheld radios for its personnel um, and to use in our emergency response um, operations. Uh, these radios were last replaced in 2005. Uh, and just as a little reminder, that was the year that uh, iPhone came out with their first iPhone. Um, and 2014, um, I think the, the iPhone edition then was uh, the eighth generation. So. We've come a long way since those years. Uh, these radios are out of life and out of service, uh, and they are used to support um, operations and emergency response. To date this year alone, we have responded uh, to nearly 100 incidents. Uh, we've deployed these radios nearly 400 times, and this project will fully replace radios that have reached the end of life and operational capabilities. Uh, they'll allow for upgraded uh, remote programming of radios. Uh, we'll save money and become more efficient by eliminating the need to travel to physical locations. And will result in less downtime for our personnel, reduction in fuel costs from driving to physical locations for radio maintenance, and less wear and tear on um, our vehicles. We appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions regarding item number 16 on the radios? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I believe next, uh, Indiana Department of Transportation. <clears throat> Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Steve McAvoy with NDOT. Uh, Indiana Department of Transportation formally requests funding in the amount of $9.6 million for the renovation of the existing Bluffton subdistrict building. This 14,000 square foot subdistrict was built in 1996, 25 years old, and is ex experiencing significant structural and operational issues. Such, some issues result in precast concrete panel cracking, okay. corner joint separation, this corner joint separation exposes the interior of the building to the outside elements and is due to temperature fluctuations that cause the panels to bow outward. <laughs> the age and condition of the structure has contributed to operational and environmental issues such as ADA accessibility in the restrooms and the conference room, garage bays that are not large enough to service a fully dressed tow plow dump truck or tanker truck, and the inability to wash trucks inside with containment. Renovation of the subdistrict will mitigate these concerns and extend the life of the building. In addition, the renovation of this subdistrict will reduce the amount of time it takes to service our dump trucks, thus reducing public safety concerns during a snow fight. Thank you. Any questions regarding item 17 for us? 
Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. You. I believe next we have Indiana Department of Transportation uh, in-core system updates. Go ahead, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, members. I am Eric Bonschbach, uh, representing the Indiana Department of Transportation. I manage the Land and Aerial Survey Office within that agency. Um, today we're asking for, to request funding to upgrade our existing statewide continuously operating reference station network known as INCORS. The network's a system of 45 permanent GPS reference stations strategically located across the state that provides accurate and reliable positioning data for a variety of applications including surveying and mapping, construction, transportation, agricultural, and others. The existing station equipment was installed in 2007, making it about 16 years old and is reaching the end of its useful service life. Since 2021, 10 of the 45 stations have been upgraded. This funding will upgrade the remaining 35 stations over the next 12 months so that the entire network will be up to date as quickly as possible. The upgrades will provide additional services like improving the accuracy, expanding the coverage, and the reduction of signal interference for all users. Thank you. Any questions regarding yeah. item number 18 before us? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have item number 19. I believe it's also the Department of Transportation. Go ahead, please, sir. Um, we have four deferred uh, maintenance projects on the agenda. Um, state budget agency has been provided a detailed list of these projects with the specific work called out the estimated costs for these four requests. The first project is fence and gate replacement. Uh, this request totals $1,548,845 and includes fence upgrades or gate replacement at 28 NDOT locations across the state. The project will consist of replacement of fencing repl fencing and installation of electronic motorized gates. Electronic motorized gates will allow for the Linnell card access system to be installed, which will increase security and provide site accountability. Thank you. Any questions regarding item 19 for us? Okay, now go ahead, please, okay. sir. The second deferred maintenance project is HVAC replacements. This request totals $2,053,890 and includes replacement of various HVAC systems at 18 NDOT locations statewide. All, the, all of these HVAC systems have reached their average life of 15 to 25 years and need to be replaced now so, so we do not have loss of service in the facilities. Thank you. Any questions on item 20? Yes, Representative Porter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. When you talk about 18 uh, different units, are, are this, is it one vendor or is it vendors from, from with those geographical areas? Geographical. The projects will be bid through the Department of Public Works individually. Okay. okay. And do, do we look at the, the cost differences between those regions and just come up with something uh, to see if we get more dollars uh, you know, for our product, so is there, is there is there a cost analysis when we when we buy things at this magnitude? Um, overall, I would say no. Um, okay. You know, like you said, they are re regional cost. You know, for these components, um, you know, our estimates were based off of discussions with local contractors. That's how we developed the estimates. Um, you know, until we bid it, we we won't know the firm cost. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions on item number 20 before us? Seeing none, thank you. Go ahead, please, sir. All right. The, deferred, the third deferred maintenance project is just what we call general rehabilitation. This request would total $1,138,810. It includes a variety of work at 21 NDOT locations across the state to include oil water separator replacements, floor drain replacements, septic system replacements, wastewater treatment plant upgrades, lighting upgrades to LED, shop equipment replacement, masonry wall repairs, building siding replacement, door replacement, ceiling fan replacements, and other um, electronic elect, uh, lighting upgrades. 
All of these general rehabilitation projects will extend the life of their facilities. Thank you. Any questions regarding item 21? Seeing none, go ahead, please, sir. Okay. The final deferred maintenance project is e exterior painting. This request totals $392,300 and includes sandblasting and repainting the exterior walls of 16 NDOT locations. All locations have extensive exterior wall paint peeling. Paint peeling exposes the precast concrete or the masonry wall to weather exposure, in which, which will shorten the life cycle of the building by allowing water to, water to infiltrate the structure. Painting of these buildings will remedy these problems and extend the life cycle of the buildings. Questions regarding item number 22? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I believe we're ready for item number 23, Department of Transportation, dealing with airport improvements. Go ahead, please, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Chair and the Budget Committee. Uh, my name is Marty Blake with the Indiana Department of Transportation's Aviation Office, and we are here today in support of the second of four um, projects that were included in this year's uh, budget bill. And I have the privilege of introducing Mike Daigle, the Executive Director of South Bend International Airport, to discuss the project. Thank you. Thank you all. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to give you a very brief overview of this project from about what we would call the 30,000 foot level. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, make some aesthetic improvements really and also increase safety to the front of the building for the traveling public. The project includes four major areas. Uh, canopies to be installed on both sides of the road to help protect people from the elements. Raised crosswalks that will help reduce the driving speed of vehicles across the front of the building and also provide a continuous elevation of walkway from the public parking lot into the building. This will also increase the passenger and customer ease and, and comfort and reduce slip and falls caused by moisture saturated footwear. This will also improve the ADA accessibility for most of our customers that have challenges. Additionally, we will provide brick and stone veneer on the front of the structure, which is primarily metal panels that have been corroded by the use of salt and other materials uh, because of the terrific weather we get in northern Indiana. The last item is improvements to the landscaped areas that will help better define the pedestrian walkways and pathways, again, improving safety and providing better separation between the parking and roadway areas. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Senator Mishler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I had an opportunity to meet with Mike at South Bend. I guess I've underestimated the importance of these airports and economic development. I know these companies that want to re relocate have a lot of requirements for flights and uh, puts a lot of pressure on these commercial airports. So I know last time we did money for Fort Wayne, I think you're going to see a need for growth uh, at these airports in Fort Wayne and South Bend. And, and if I recall, this is a small piece. You have a lot of federal money to make a lot of the improvements you're trying to uh, expand. Yes, Senator, we are in uh, year three of about a $70 million federal project to improve airside access and, again, ease and comfort for our passengers. Um, as you know, we've got a major economic development going on in our part of the state, and with the GM Samsung facility that's coming in and the assorted companies that will also locate in that area, uh, we were the first airport in the nation who had lost Detroit service by Delta now to have it restored. And we also have other conversations with other airlines and other uh, routes to other markets that are under consideration because of all this economic activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mishler. Other comments regarding item 23 or questions? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I believe next we're ready for item number 24, Department of Workforce Development. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Josh Richardson from the Department of Workforce Development. Uh, I'm here today to ask you uh, for our um, $4 million uh, appropriation here uh, for um, really helping improve a consistent look 
uh, and feel and user experience across the systems that the Department of Workforce Development holds. We uh, have a lot of tools that we're proud of, but uh, many of these tools require individuals to have unique registrations, uh, logins as they move from unemployment insurance to career exploration to job search. And so um, what these dollars will really allow us to do is build out the data infrastructure uh, to make sure that that is a streamlined experience for the user and helps them maximize their journey through our services so that they can become uh, gainfully employed. Thank you. Any questions regarding item number 24, Forrest? Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I believe next we have Commission for Higher Education, Josh Garrison. Item number 25, 26 and 27, I believe. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Garrison with the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. We're here to, uh, I'm also joined by President Sean Huddleston of Martin University for our first item. We are requesting the release of $2.5 million allocated in the budget for Martin University with the purpose of attracting and retaining students in high demand careers such as education, law enforcement, science, technology, technology engineering, and mathematics. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and I have uh, President Huddleston to answer any questions that you may have. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions regarding item 25? Welcome, Mr. President, glad you're here. Thank you. Seeing none, th thank you. All right. And next, item number 26. Yeah, and Seth and Michelle will take that one. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Michelle Ashcraft. I'm the Chief Program Officer for the Commission for Higher Education. And we are requesting $2.5 million uh, that came through the budget for the College Success Program which defines uh, the responsibility for us to determine a program to support 21st century scholars, Frank O'Bannon recipients, first generation students, and minority students who are currently enrolled in our campuses that offer four year degree programs across the state. We are proposing to use that funding to embed 31 student success coaches in those campuses across the state. Uh, that funding would provide for salaries, benefits, and startup costs for office supplies and training. Uh, with the assumption that the colleges, when they submit their proposal to receive one or more of those coaches, that they would uh, present to us a sustainability plan to continue that position long-term on their campus. This has been proposed on a model that has been used at Purdue University, where student success coaches have been used for over 10 years to support 21st century scholars on that campus. As a result, they have seen over 25 percentage point increase in their four-year completion rate for students in general, as well as a 12.5 percentage point increase for students of color and those who are first-generation students. This also represents uh, success that we have had with other federal grants in the past where we have provided short-term funding for the campuses to start positions that then they have uh, created sustainability plans for to maintain those positions on campus. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yes, Our Senator Cadora. Thank you. I just want to confirm. Um, I read recently that due to the legislation that we passed recently to auto enroll the 21st century scholars, that the number has increased by over 10 or 15,000. Can you confirm what the what the new number is? Yes, we just went through auto enrollment for the 2027 cohort who are current ninth graders. Uh, prior to doing auto enrollment, we had about 20,000 students in the cohort, and we have just over 40,000 students in the cohort so now. So almost doubled. Correct, yes. That's amazing. Yep, and we won't see those students obviously enroll in campus for a few years now, but we do have many students who are in the pipeline, and so this would allow the campuses to uh, start to build support on their campuses, not only to support <laughs> current students, but to prepare for auto enrollment um, to, to come in a few years. A final question to confirm. So we went from 20,000 to 40, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's auto enrollment. Does that also confirm that the 40,000 students actually applied, enrolled, and are currently admitted in these universities? Great question. So the, the auto enrolled students, because they are current ninth graders, um, we will be mailing letters to them and their families in October to talk about 
creating their scholar track accounts, signing the pledge, doing those activities that they have to do in high school to prepare to activate their scholarships and enroll in college. So these positions would specifically support the, the 21st century scholars who are already enrolled in college. But with our new pre-admissions initiative that we have launched, which will deliver letters to high school seniors, letting them know what institutions they've been pre-admitted to, these staff could certainly help uh, with the enrollment process for our current seniors. I appreciate this. I'm going to make a plug to my own colleagues on this committee is that I have, I'm a parent of uh, two daughters. One already went to college this year. The second one is in high school. And I can tell you the crisis, I appreciate this work, but we have a crisis with our counselors at high schools across the, uh, across the state. Um, this is not me talking as a parent about my daughter. She's a 4.8 on a 4.0 scale student. And she missed two weeks of instructional maths, uh, advanced uh, AP statistics, because she was placed in the wrong math class because the, the, the counselors have four to 500 students per counselor. So we're putting all of these dollars to advance 21st century scholars and others to help students transition and enroll on time and graduate on time. But within the school system, these, we don't have enough counselors to guide and have ample time to sit with these students to tell them, here's the application, go to Skyward, Navians, and um, you know the uh, Common App, mm -hmm. and here's how you apply. So I, I urge the commission and my colleagues to seriously look at the crisis we have in our state that is preventing these students from getting all the information. I'll conclude with one example. There's a, a person of a minority community, he's in his 50s, and he came to me in my district and he said, one of the regrets of my life when I was in high school, I went to my counselor and he told me, your type is not a college type. Your type is not a college type. And he regrets that he didn't go to college because he didn't have an empathetic counselor that can help and support. That was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, or 35 years ago. So I urge all of us, the commission and my colleagues, to seriously look at that crisis because it is part of that process that is breaking students moving from high school into colleges. But this is amazing news, and I really appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Other questions regarding or comments on item 26? Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, over, over the course of years, we've heard how successful 21st Century Scholar has been. Uh, we, we know the, the, um, the students have increased, uh, you know, due to uh, recession and things like that. My question is, with this, these dollars, uh, is it going to be sustain, sustainable? I mean, you, 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 now we have a new program, out of a, grew, has grew out of another program that birthed this program. Um, and my question is, is, it, or is this going to be a one and done, or you know, one biennium and done? What are you doing, and where are those, where are these these students going to, these educators going to come from, with the teacher shortage that we already have? Are we going to start purging uh, to do, you know, to to try to uh, address this gap to help navigate this whole system? So I'm just, what is this just now, or is there a long, is there? Uh, a strategic plan, longevity on it, or what? Or is this just a reaction? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, our mm -hmm. hope with this is to, when the campuses submit their proposals, is for them to submit a sustainability plan as part of that proposal for how they would continue these positions yeah. moving forward. Where we have campuses that have similar positions already, the strategy they've most often used is hiring 21st century scholar graduates from their campuses to be in positions like these so they can speak from their experience and help the 21st century scholars and other low income and minority students moving forward. So I wouldn't anticipate that we would be purging our current educators, but rather bringing those who are from 21st century scholars and other communities into education to serve into these roles. Uh, we have used, as I mentioned, some federal grants in the past to initiate some roles like this that have been sustained on the campuses before. And so this would allow some capacity building initially um, as they to serve the current scholars and then to continue to build out for the influx of scholars that will come in the future. Right, and I, and Mr. Chairman, just a brief comment. Okay, federal dollars, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I hope we apply for those federal dollars. There's been a time mm -hmm. in the past with the Gear Up program, we did not, and we missed the opportunity. And it's happened on, on several occasions when it came to education, uh, higher ed. So yeah. hopefully you guys, can, uh, someone 
will stay on top of it so we yeah. don't miss out on those federal yes. dollars because we have in the past yeah. that's put us in predicament in which we are in today. I appreciate that. I can confirm that we have applied for those dollars and we should hear by the end of the month if we were successful in the GEAR UP program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Porter. Good, good questions. Further questions regarding item 26? Yes, Representative Garten. Or Senator Garden, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Thank sir. You. Are you promoting me or demoting me, Mr. Chair? <laughs> I, I won't comment. I want to <laughs> Thank have you, a Mr. peaceful Chairman. day today. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Just, just a quick question, sure. and, and if I missed this part of your presentation, I apologize. How would you get to 31? Yeah, uh, so uh, we have looked at what the average starting salaries for an entry level coach or advisor like position is on the campuses currently, both across the the public and the private campuses. As you can imagine, it fluctuates a little bit from campus to campus. And so we've provided a suggested range for a salary and then what benefits would be on top of that. And then looked at what initial startup costs for office space and technology like computers, phones, those sorts of things. And so uh, we took that total amount and divided the 2.5 million to get to 31. Um, and then the, the remaining funds we would use to provide some centralized training for those individuals once they're all hired. Um, one thing that they would gain access to is our state scholar track system to be able to support uh, the students in terms of financial aid requirements. So we provide training on that system um, as well as just other state financial aid policies and student support um, strategies that may be helpful to them. And then how are we measuring with the dollars spent in this space, how are we measuring success? Of those 31 folks, what metrics, is, what metrics are we measuring? Are we saying, hey, you know, one of each of these 31 is expected to graduate X amount of students sooner, get them into the work? Help me understand how we're measuring success. Yeah, uh, this was certainly uh, initially tied for this first year to uh, enrollment and retention. Uh, so especially I mentioned our new pre-admissions initiative that's going to deliver opportunity to students by telling them that they are pre-admitted to institutions across the state. It would be helping those students enroll and then yielding those students over the summer to make sure that they actually enroll after accepting their admission. Um, and then looking specifically at first year retention for students that they make it through that first year. Once the campuses have built those sustainability plans and, and made the long-term decision to keep these individuals on their campus, then we would continue to look at retention rates, on-time completion rates, if not early graduation, uh, through some of the other initiatives that we have. Um, and then we are, uh, this among any, many others, would be part of our strategy for um, Commissioner Lowry's graduate retention. Um, so not only how do we get them through on time to complete, but how do we keep them in our state as well? So we plan to tie this to some of the new career coaching requirements um, that have come out of 1002 as well. These individuals would help connect these students to their career coaching meetings as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Further questions regarding item 26? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I believe next we have item number 27, the Commission for Higher Education also with the Heartland Anderson Schooler, or Scholars, I'm sorry, House. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seth Hinshaw uh, with the Commission for Higher Seth. Education. I'm going to be joined by former State Senator Doug Eckerty, who is actually the Executive Director of Job Source Inc., uh, the organization at East Central Indiana that runs the Scholars House program. Really quickly, I just wanted to provide a, a quick background to this item. Senate Bill 392 passed the Senate uh, 48 to 1 this last legislative session and outlined a number of purposes um, of a housing program for mo uh, mothers seeking to continue their education. It included allowable uh, uses, including programmatic expansion, service expansion, facility improvements and debt reduction, outreach to impoverished single mothers in minority communities, and scholarship assistance, gap coverage, and social services for those mothers. Um, so I wanted to uh, just give that quick backdrop because we've used the language in Senate Bill 392 to build the framework for this, uh, but I'd like to turn it over, if I could, to Senator Eckerty to fill in a little bit more of the work and the background of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, Chairman Thompson and members of the committee, thank you for letting me be here this morning. Um, I'll give you a little background, quick background about Scholar House. Uh, it started in Louisville, Kentucky, 25, about 25 years ago. It services the uh, uh, group that uh, Seth just talked about, uh, single mothers, greatly impoverished, minority groups. Uh, most have been um, uh, abused um, throughout the course of their life in many, many different ways. Uh, most have been homeless at a point in time in their life. Sadly, some have been trafficked. Um, it's the way of the world, I suppose. 
Um, what they do in Louisville is they provide uh, housing and wraparound support services to allow these folks to uh, pursue a post-secondary career, be it a uh, highly skilled trades school, to your institution or for your college. It doesn't make any difference which, as long as they're going um, for more education. We um, liked their model very much uh, when we ran across it a couple years ago. Their graduation rate is in about 91%. Um, the vast majority, well into the 90s, go on to very, very productive high wage jobs that they um, keep for very long periods of time. Uh, most become homeowners. Uh, they've been at it long enough down there that they're seeing now the children of the original parents and the second generation of parents that have been through. Their children are now going to college, so they've touched two generations. We opened our first facility in the state of Indiana in Anderson back um, August of last year. Uh, we have opened two phases and we're waiting to open the third phase upon uh, our reconstruction and completion. We have been looking to expand the program throughout the state and strategic locations. Uh, we have had uh, conversations with Vincennes University and the community of Vincennes, uh, Indiana Wesleyan University and the community of Marion. Ball State University, Muncie, and I do want to put a, a kudo out there to Ball State University because they are providing us with uh, up to 20 apartments uh, for our first set of scholars that we anticipate will be um, enrolling at Ball State about this time next year uh, and going. So that's it in a nutshell, and I know this is new, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Any questions? Representative Delaney. Thank you, Senator. Could you explain the funding source? To funding source, funding today, source here. Funding source today has been completely private. Okay. And it's what? I'm sorry. Has been completely private to date. Private today. The reference here is to the Pokagon Band Fund. Is that part of the money? I don't know what you're referring to. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, let me let me try this one, yeah. Representative. Yeah, so you. so just as a reminder. Um, the the state entered into a revenue sharing right. agreement with the um, Pokagon Band Potawatomi tribe that that allows us to um, they are sending some the state some revenues every year um, off the top of my head I, I think we're talking about three or four million a year something in that ballpark with the expectation that might eventually grow to maybe more like seven or eight million um, but in this last budget bill uh, there were a couple appropriations made out of that funding source, and that's that's what this is: is is the states received it, and it's a, being it was appropriate in the budget bill for this purpose. Yeah, as an independent nation or sovereign nation, they don't have tax obligations, but we have an agreement with them that provides support, exactly, and, right? yeah, revenue sharing. And I think in terms of like we, we provide um, things like a road to the to the door and some infrastructure, things like right. that, and in exchange, they they are sending revenue back to the state. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on item 27? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Seeing you, Senator, reminds me I failed in the introductions. Uh, Representative Snow, welcome, and Senator Deary are both present, and welcome, both of you. Senator Yoder, Colonel Yoder was and, here. And Senator Yoder was also here, I believe, someone said. Thank you. I believe next we're ready to go to university projects, and first on the list, is Indiana University, and I believe at the Bloomington campus is the first one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Budget Committee. Uh, uh, on behalf of Indiana University, pleasure to be with you again this morning. Uh, I've got three projects for your consideration. Uh, as the Chairman noted, the first one will be on the Bloomington campus. Uh, this is uh, renovation of buildings in the Wells Quad and our public health building. Uh, we have had great success uh, over the last decade or so uh, with your help uh, in renovating many of our older buildings on the Bloomington campus that some uh, exceed over 100 years old uh, that have uh, definite infrastructure needs. And so we have uh, prioritized uh, uh, major scale renovation of those buildings on the campus, on the Bloomington campus uh, over that period of time 
and have now had uh, a significant number of projects that have been completed. This is the next phase of, of, of that renovation. It will involve four buildings. It will involve the public health building, which was first constructed, constructed in 1917. Uh, it will also involve the renovation of Sycamore Hall, Morrison Hall, and the Music Annex building for a total of 572,000 square feet. Uh, and so obviously this is a significant amount of square footage in four different buildings. And uh, for a, a total investment of $89.5 million funded by the state of Indiana in the last budget bill, we deeply appreciate your, um, uh, your support of this continuing renovation of our older infrastructure. I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions on this one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is Morrison Hall any connection? Uh, I thought when I first got there that was very nice of them to do, but uh, no, it's named after Sarah Park Morrison, one of our first students. Thank you, Senator Messler. Great question. Uh, other questions <laughs> regarding project number one? Thank you. Go ahead. Number two, please. Second project is on the Indianapolis campus uh, for the School of Dentistry. Uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, the uh, Indiana University has the only school of dentistry in the state of Indiana uh, and uh, exists uh, in an older complex of buildings uh, uh, on the campus. This is also uh, an, another phase in R&R and renovation of that complex. Uh, great credit to the School of Dentistry. They've been able to, in first two phases, uh, renovate the older portions of the building and expand their clinic functions. Uh, and this is the third phase, which will allow us to um, uh, renovate space for the Oral Health uh, Institute, as well, which is a research institute, and as well as uh, create new instruction space uh, that will be uh, privately funded ph philanthropy for the instruction of dentists in treating uh, people with severe disabilities and uh, def a definite need in our country, and, uh, and so this will expand space in that regard. This renovation will be about 60,000 square feet. It will uh, uh, be $10.4 million funded by philanthropy and School of Dentistry funds. Uh, it uh, uh, also involves uh, the renovation of space uh, related to um, student commons uh, to allow the, the, the dental students to have more study space as well. i uh, be happy to answer any questions on this one. Thank you. Any questions regarding project number two? Saying then, go ahead, please. Number three. And then the, the third one is also on the Indianapolis campus, and it's my pleasure to uh, call it Indiana University Indianapolis. Uh, and so this is a project that was funded in the most uh, recent uh, uh, General Assembly and for, uh, for the renovation and expansion of research labs uh, on the campus as part of the Science and Technology Corridor uh, in, 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 in conjunction uh, uh, with uh, our partners at Purdue. Uh, we've been able to uh, really uh, scope out uh, new space uh, on the campus that will serve both institutions. Uh, this particular project is related to uh, an expansion of our science and engineering lab building uh, on the corner of uh, New York and Blackford uh, in Indianapolis. And then as well, it will involve the renovation of existing labs within the School of Science. Um, the, uh, the total cost of the project is $60 million with about $35 million of that being in the expansion and the rest being renovation of existing labs. Uh, uh, again, state uh, funded by uh, the state of Indiana, deeply appreciative. Be happy to answer any questions here. Thank you. Questions regarding item number three? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I believe next is item number four on the projects, Purdue University. Ed, please. <clears throat> Members of the committee, Alicia Nafziger with Purdue University. So this project before you today is our runway rehabilitation project at the Purdue University Airport. The total cost is $3.6 million with um, 3,147,625 coming from a Federal Aviation Administration grant 
um, and the remainder coming from operating funds reserves at Purdue. Our airport is heavily used by our School of Aviation Technology and Transportation. Um, they were actually anticipating their largest incoming class this fall with around 1,000 beginning students. These dollars, the federal dollars, pass through NDOT to Purdue University, and the money is based on our capital needs at the airport, and these are reviewed every year. We had a similar project around three to four years ago. So three parts to this project is repaving a runway, um, and then a small connector taxi will be taxiway will be relocated and reconstructed. Um, and then another small connector taxiway will actually be, um, that's no longer in use, will be eliminated. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions regarding the runway project? Thank you for your presentation. Next is Ivy Tech, item number five, regarding the nursing facility. members of the committee, Mary Jane Michael Lack with Ivy Tech Community College. Um, we're here today to request approval of $38 million for our Indianapolis nursing restructure project. The Indiana General Assembly allocated $33 million for the project and we plan to raise $5 million. So we're just asking for approval to be able to spend up to $38 million if we are able to raise that $5 million, which we believe the Indianapolis campus will do. Um, the plan for this is to relocate our nursing facility from the Lawrence Township facility Fairbanks building and bring it downtown, which is in line with where the hospitals in Indianapolis are. Um, so we'll be renovating areas on campus to put that on the Indianapolis campus in downtown Indianapolis. The Fairbanks building needs about 28 to $30 million in HVAC and other renovations and rehabilitation just to bring the building up to um, speed and to make some adjustments to that. And so um, expanding the campus downtown makes more sense for that. And then we will explore other options for that facility in Lawrence Township. We'll be talking with the city of Lawrence to discuss what some of those options are. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be um, adjusting some space for our advanced manufacturing. And then that will allow us to um, demolish a 6,000 square foot building on campus and relocate our advanced manufacturing all into one area. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Representative Delaney? Yeah, Marion, thank you. Uh, will this increase the number of nursing students that are able to be trained? So the Indianapolis campus is our biggest campus. It serves about 20% of students statewide, and it is our biggest nursing program. Um, we have a plan in place, um, and with your support, House Enrolled Act 1002 in 2022 was, uh, was passed. That was Nursing Indi back, Indiana Back to Health. It gave us some administrative abilities to increase our nursing program. At that time, we had planned to increase by 600 students by 2025. Um, I believe we are already at 538 students in addition to since that time. So thank you for the ability to expand, and we believe that by um, spring, we will be up to 738 new students. So yes, this will allow us to serve more students in the Indianapolis area. That's critical. And then the, 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 the second question, I'm impressed and pleased to see that you're trying to raise private money or donor money. Is this something new for Ivy Tech? No, we always try to raise donor money, um, but we don't Always, we aren't always able to do that for big projects. Um, our Columbus campus was one of the campuses that you funded. It was $40 million um, four years ago that was allocated by the General Assembly and we were able to raise funds. So what that will do is it will allow us to renovate additional space on the campus if we're able to raise that. We have been in discussions with employers about some possibilities, um, flex labs and things like that that will enable us to do. No, sure. best, best wishes for success in that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on item number five? Sure. Project number five? Yes. Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I believe now we're ready for review items, and we have first Medicaid state plan amendments and waivers. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Cora Steinmetz, and I am the director of the Office of Medicaid Policy and Planning within the Family and Social Services Administration. 
We have four state plan amendments brought before you for review today. The first uh, state plan amendment is a continuation of the behavioral and primary health care coordination program within the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. This program serves individuals with serious mental illness and co-occurring co physical health care needs, not otherwise eligible for Medicaid or our SMI and SUD waivers. The primary service delivered uh, under this program is case management for complex care coordination needs. Our community mental health centers are the provider for these services. This particular spa has no fiscal associated with it. There are only two changes to the program that are associated with the state plan amendment, which include a conforming change to the 2021 telehealth legislation under HEA 1468 and addition of a service delivery and quality measure. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions regarding the first presentation? Seeing none, go ahead please to the this, next one. Thank you. The second state plan amendment is our HIP equalization spa. Since the inception of the HIP program, physicians and other professional practitioners have been paid at 100% of Medicare rates, which is a higher rate amount than our other managed care and fee-for-service programs. Our federal partner, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, directed Indiana, among other states, to equalize rates across all Medicaid programs. In partnership with you under AGA 1001, we were directed to increase reimbursement for all physician and professional services across fee-for-service and managed care programs to align with the HIP program at 100% of Medicare. These rate changes will be effective on January 1st, 2024 in alignment with our compliance plan with CMS. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions, Senator Cadora? Good to see you, appreciate you, thank and you. welcome aboard. Thank you, uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Um, does the Medicaid rate for uh, impact also home health rates, or will this have an impact on home health rates? Uh, home health rates were a separate rate, uh, strategic rate item that we also included um, in our rate matrix schedule. Right. So this is not encompassing um, the home health rates, but those also received an increase um, effective July 1, 2023. I appreciate you. I will uh, discuss with you separately after the meeting. I received some information from constituents that most of the increase that was given to home health is going to the agencies and not to the workers. So the workers saw a couple of dollars increase, but we're still dealing with the same crisis of not having home health individuals across the state. Uh, my colleagues did a wonderful job of increasing funding for home health, and I supported that, and I appreciate your work. Would love just to follow up with them that one piece. Thank appreciate you, Senator. It. I'd be happy to have that discussion. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Further questions? Number three, please, then. The third state plan amendment brought before you is another item on our strategic investment of the rate matrix. Uh, this is for non-emergency medical transportation services. Our NEMT services ensure that our Medicaid members have reliable and accessible access to transportation to non-emergency services like physician appointments and dialysis treatments. The proposed strategic investment is a 20% increase. Uh, this fiscal impact is uh, only $200,000 because as we completed our rate work, we discovered that the managed care entities and our brokered uh, fee-for-service um, NEMT benefits were already paying at market rate. So this is a very narrow portion of our Medicaid population um, to align rates across all of our NEMT services. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. So number four then, please. The final state plan amendment before you is an administrative simplicity item. As a growing number of our Medicaid rates are now aligned to a percentage of Medicare, we have a need to address the timing of those rates. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services typically does not release the Medicare rates until December of each year, causing delays in our ability to implement the corresponding Medicaid rates by the next January. This causes delayed payments to our providers, provider abrasion, and a need to perform retroactive adjustments to those rates. For this reason, uh, we propose tying the Medicaid rates to the previous year Medicare rate uh, in order to reduce that provider abrasion and create some reliability in the rates that they will be seeing. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Thanks for your presentation. Thank you for Appreciate your time. That.
Next on the agenda, we have the rainy day fund loan update. Gentlemen, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jacob Blaisdell. I serve as the executive director of the Indiana Bond Bank. I'm joined here to my left by Ron Magus, who serves as our director of operations. Uh, we're here today on behalf of Treasurer State Daniel Elliott. Uh, under Indiana Code 6.1 or 6.1-22.1, certain entities in Lake County are eligible to receive a loan from the Rainy Day Fund through the Treasurer of State. Loans under this statute are to provide property tax revenue shortfall assistance due to, and I'll quote the statute, erroneous assessed valuation figures being provided to the city, township, or school corporation. Such loans have been requested by two eligible entities, the City of Hobart and the Maryville Community School Corporation. Subject to budget committee review, Treasurer Elliott intends to extend the requested loans in amounts and under terms as follows. A $15 million, $15 million $660,000 loan to the city of Hobart and a $12 million $165,000 loan to the Maryville Community School Corporation, both for a term of 25 years and both at an interest rate of 0% as permitted under the applicable code. The amounts re requested uh, reflect funds needed by the entities to one, repay and extinguish loans currently in existence related to the tax appeal issue extended by the Indiana Bond Bank at the end of 2022, and two, provide funds to meet future revenue shortfalls that will result from periodic tax deductions by Lake County as established under the settlement agreement reached between the City of Hobart, Maryville Community School Corporation, and Lake County. Details of those cash flows and sources and uses have been provided, and I understand are included in your meeting materials. I also have copies of Helpful. On behalf of Treasurer Elliott, I thank you for your time in this review. We hope the proposed terms are consistent with the intent of the legislation, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Any questions regarding those loans? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Great. Thank you. I believe next we have Invest Ed, Commission for Higher Education. Oops, so sorry. sorry Michelle. Hello again. Um, I'm just here to kick it off and then we'll turn over to uh, our invested colleague to, to share a little bit more. Uh, this is in regard to a program called Teach Dual Credit Indiana. This program was created through grant funding support through Invested to support the credentialing of teachers for dual credit as a result of the new requirements from the Higher Learning Commission that are in effect through uh, 2025, uh, in which case we need to um, further credential the many current teachers who are teaching dual credit so that they will remain eligible to teach those courses, as well as credential additional teachers uh, to maintain the dual credit needs that we have in our state. Uh, we currently, uh, through the most recent grant that Invested funded, have had 1,403 course completions from teachers across our state. Um, and this mirrors another program called STEM Teach. This funded through our um, independent colleges of Indiana. Um, so the STEM Teach program allows teachers to be credentialed um, through STEM related courses um, and Teach Dual Credit Indiana uh, covers the liberal arts side. So with that, I will turn it over for questions. Yes, uh, thank you Chairman Thompson, members of the committee for having us today. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, in 2020, uh, InvestEd gave a $3 million grant to CHE to partner with Cell to help address uh, the, the dual credit teacher licensing issue that will be upon us uh, from HLC's ruling. Uh, due to COVID and some of those other things, that has been kicked back a little bit. We have seen a, a drastic improvement in the number of teachers that are credentialed and meet those new requirements. Uh, in 2016, we had about 30% of teachers qualified. Now we're at about 65%. Um, so another round of funding here would really help us uh, hit those numbers in line with CHE and Department of Education goals in uh, extending and expanding our dual credit programs. Uh, it's right in line with InvestEd's mission to help students uh, per, uh, access post-secondary education with, with the least amount of debt possible. And so these dual credit programs are allowing students to do that. So I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Thank you. Any questions regarding the invest ed? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, guys. I believe next under review items we have number four regarding tuitions and fees, uh, Ivy Tech.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I appreciate your time being here today. My colleague is handing out some slides to talk through. Uh, we're here to talk about IV Tech's uh, tuition and fees for fiscal years 24 and 25. Uh, on page two, it talks about our guiding principles and the way we go about uh, establishing our budget. A structurally balanced budget with revenues matching expenditures is critical to the institution. And on number two and three, you'll see transparency and equitable access and pricing. This is something where we've really focused this year and how we established our tuition and fees that we charge to students. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we really look holistically at what the price students pay is. Um, it's beyond just tuition and mandatory fees, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. On the third slide, <clears throat> you'll see uh, this is Indiana's public institution tuition and fees, tuition and mandatory fees. And that's the uh, recommendation that comes out of the commission. And we take very seriously the Commission for Higher Education's tuition and fee recommendation, which is based on tuition plus mandatory fees. And mandatory fees at public institutions are assessed to all students. There are other fees at institutions that are charged to certain students, like program fees or course fees and so on. But you can see here, Ivy Tech remains the most affordable option in the state of Indiana, and this is something we're very proud of. On, on the next slide, uh, you'll see consumer cost increases. This, this is what we're battling with is inflation. You'll see we've got headline as the overall and then core, and then what we've done is we've adjusted in real dollars our operating budget over this time period since January 2015, which shows the purchasing power down 1%. This is not a complaint. We're very proud of this. We're trying to find ways to be more efficient and do more with, with uh, fewer resources, which then feeds into the cost that we have to charge students. On the next slide, uh, this is our full-time tuition and fees. So on a nominal basis from 2015 to 2024, it's increased 21%. But what we are really looking at is when you adjust those in real dollars, what are, what are we charging to students? So in a, on the adjusted rate is actually down 4% when comparing 2024 and 2015. And this is something that we're really focused on is staying behind inflation or in line with inflation each time we set this and not getting ahead. Higher education for so long had exceeded uh, the rate of inflation. And so this is, what we, this is one number that we do look at, at and track regularly. On the next slide, it talks about Ivy Tech student debt. This is the percentage of Ivy Tech graduates that graduate with, that graduate with any debt. So in 2015, it was almost 52%. And in our most recent year, 2022, we're down to 18.2%, a reduction of 34%. This is something we work on um, diligently uh, in education, through education, and also just remaining affordable. Uh, we were with our HERF dollars that we received during the pandemic, uh, we took the institution portion. Half was for emergency student aid, half was for institutional costs associated with the pandemic. We really tried to double down on investing the institutional dollars into student success. So we did cover books for all students for those two years. We were also able to freeze tuition for uh, those two years as well in fiscal years 22 and 23. And um, we also, the minimum finance, uh, aid that went out to students, we exceeded that by $27 million. So we took institutional dollars and we were encouraged by the US Department of Education to, if possible, take your institutional dollars and distribute more to students. And we were able to do that exceeding the, the minimum amount by 27 million. <clears throat> so on the next slide, you can see our prior tuition and fee structure. and. What we're really trying to do is head in the direction of students understanding the, the price they're going to pay on the front end and not be surprised by separate and additional fees that they receive on their bill. So previously, students would be assessed a rate and they would also be assessed a $75 mandatory technology fee. And that was priced per head. It was, it, so a student taking one credit hour would receive $75 fee and 15 as well. And uh, so on a percent basis, that one credit hour, you're approaching 50%. So when we talk about equity, that's what we're trying to do is, is align it so it's just one tuition price and really do away with the technology fee being separately charged and just roll it into tuition. Uh, now, the commission's recommendation of 3.5% over the next two years, 
that really has no impact to roll it in other than our students won't see it as a separate charge because they're making a recommendation based on tuition plus mandatory fees and that was our sole mandatory fee that we applied so doing it's it's now part of tuition and we would have no separately charged mandatory fees going forward the other fee that we really wanted to do something about was the distance education fee and that was charged at $20 a credit hour and it, it, if you look on the next slide, it was assessed to about 75% of our students. And it was assessed based on the modality in which they were taking the course. So for Ivy Online students, they would receive $20 credit hour fee. Um, and blended is another modality where they do a large portion online and they may come in to do lab work <clears throat> in person. They would also receive a $20 distance education fee. And you could trace this back and these fees really started uh, I always compare it to Microsoft Office when you used to get a 16 digit code that you would type in and it was really charged per license and things have have just changed technology has become pervasive throughout the institution and we're all all of us employees and students are using Microsoft Office and it's not specific to individuals so we purchase institution-wide licensing and for zoom our learning management system and it goes on and on so while they started when technology was sort of new and actually more expensive at that time. Um, it's really become part of everything that we do at the institution. The challenge for us to eliminate the fee is that over time it has become part of the revenue structure of the institution and it generates about $10 million in revenue. So uh, the next slide you can see, uh, this is really um, taking you through the steps that we took. Uh, you starting with three, the three and a half percent recommendation that the Commission for Higher Education made, and then we have to add uh, about 2.4 percent to that to recover 4.5 million of that 10 million dollars. We don't have to recover all of it because we're we are trying to be more efficient, and we we want to um, uh, do everything we can to to not have to fully replace that 10 million. But that that's where we ended up in order to have a structurally balanced budget. So the total combined would be. 5.93% on its face, but um, uh, students are no longer going to be, a, be paying that separate distance education fee that is not mandatory. So the recommendation that the Commission for Higher Education makes is tuition and mandatory, but we've rolled in a non-mandatory fee, which is not an apples to apples, and that's what we're, we're trying to um, walk you through today, is just that we took that step to eliminate that extra fee, and it's no longer going to be charged. After fiscal year 24, we won't have the distance education fee. We won't have the separately charged mandatory technology fee. We'll just have that tuition price that students understand fully. And in fiscal year 25, again, starting with the 3.5%, and then you'll see the additional 1.4% there. That is related to the prospective funding that we're working with the Commission for Higher Education on. We did include the prospective funding, 2.4 million in fiscal year 24 to balance our budget. Um, for that, we submitted a plan and received access to the funding, but we're still working through fiscal year 25 um, and, and don't have visibility into what we would receive at that time and, and when within the fiscal year to count it as part of our budget. Now, go after, in future fiscal years, it, once you earn the, my understanding is that once you earn the, the prospective funding, it becomes part of your base. So it would certainly influence future tuition and fee uh, decisions this amount here. But there, there may be an issue um, ongoing in the second year of the biennium related to prospective funding without the visibility into uh, what we would, would receive. So the next slide here is uh, talks about student impact. And so remember, 75% of students were receiving that distance education fee that is no longer going to be assessed. So when you look at the price students actually pay, money out of their pocket, uh, for 66% of our students, they're actually going to be paying less overall than before. Uh, for 13% of our students, they'll be paying that 3.5% or less, and then uh, 21% will be paying more than 3.5%. So it really depends on the students' schedule, what modalities they were in, uh, the impact to them, and there are a couple examples in here. Uh, but the, the main takeaway here is for the majority it's going down, but also 
the equity issue that we were trying to adjust, uh, uh, to, cr to fix for the future, which was that technology has just become pervasive throughout the institution, we're all using it, and we don't want to charge students differently based on the technology that we're using. So the next slide we've added is just what's that revenue impact for Ivy Tech? If we had just done 3.5%, which was recommended on tuition and mandatory fees, Ivy Tech would have received an additional $13.5 million in revenue over the biennium. But because we're not recovering all that distance education fee revenue and, and only 4.5 million of the 10, the additional revenue with what we did is just over $8 million. So less revenue, it, we would have generated more revenue just doing the three and a half percent, but we wanted to be more transparent and equitable in our pricing and, and set this pricing structure up for the long term and the future. The next in the, uh, two slides are just two examples. So this distance education student is in 15 credit hours and eight of them are distance ed. So under the prior structure would have paid a, their tuition price plus the, the mandatory technology fee of 75 plus eight distance ed hours times $20 a credit hour, which would be 160, um, so 2478. And under this model, their, their overall price is actually gonna go down 1%. And um, the next example is 12 credit hours on campus, but three of them are distance ed, and they would have paid the $75 technology fee and $60 in distance education fees, and uh, under the new model, their, their rate will go up 3%. So it's, it's impacting students differently depending on uh, the circumstances, that essentially primarily the number of distance education hours they were in. And they will, that really is uh, around flexibility around their schedule, what they take and when, and um, they're really mapping that out to determine what is best for, the, for their schedule, but um, that fee would no longer be charged. So the last two slides just show the adopted structure for fiscal years 24 and, and 25. And uh, you'll see there that there's no longer a distance ed fee and really trying to highlight that the, the mandatory fee is gone. So it's just the, it, it would just be the tuition rate that students would, would see. Um, in addition to that, we, as I said uh, from the beginning, we, we really look at what they pay holistically. We've grown our IB Plus textbooks program. Textbooks is an area where we've been very focused. We, we did use HERF dollars uh, to cover the last two fiscal years. This will be the first fiscal year that, that students actually pay the rate that we've negotiated with publishers. When we started negotiating with 180 publishers and a bookstore manager, our quoted price was almost $40 a credit hour for to provide books to students. We negotiated and got that down because of our, the volume that we can drive and, and negotiate on their behalf to $19 a credit hour for the last two years. And in the next two years, this fiscal year here, they're paying $17 a credit hour. Next year, it'll be $16.50. So in a time of high inflation, we're continuing to try to negotiate on their behalf. Students can opt out of that model, and we just got data for fall that shows that uh, about 0.25% of students have chosen to opt out, which to me is a testament to the value that they're getting from us negotiating for textbooks on their behalf. They have the choice to opt out, they're, cho they're, they're not taking it. Um, so, and really one of the biggest reasons why we're also trying to do that is to move, they understand what the per credit hour price on textbooks is at the beginning. Prior to this structure, you might, students are price takers with textbooks, you get your syllabus, typically around the beginning of class, and the book could be $400. They understand now it's this price per credit hour for all your textbooks. You don't have to figure that out once you get all of your syllabi, and we'll continue to keep trying to drive the, the price down for textbooks as well. So that, that's really the, uh, the data and the decision making that we use to set our tuition and fees. It's deeper than just that advertised price and, and hope uh, that brought some clarity, but I'm happy to take any questions or provide any data that the members uh, would like to see. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions? Senator Cadora? Uh, how's your enrollment been so far? Any new trends in the post-COVID era, whether on a regional level or on a statewide level? Yeah, we, thank you for the question. And we, we are above pre-pandemic levels in enrollment. Our last three terms have been positive. 
uh, fall, we're, we've, we are an eight-week model now, so we have two eight weeks within the fall term, so we're, we're in the first uh, series. Second eight weeks, we're still working, but we're right now, and it, it, will, it, it will depend on where we end up for fall two, but we're looking like we're between five and six percent up for fall. So uh, community colleges are typically counter-cyclical in nature. We compete with a very tight labor market, and we really feel like we're um, able to attract students even in that kind of environment in ways that other community colleges in the country are not. And, and uh, so we're really proud that we have those kind of increases in enrollments while the labor market is still very tight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Appreciate that. I believe next is Public Broadcasting Service. Welcome. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Mark Newman representing Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. Uh, I appreciate this oppor opportunity to join you today and for your continued support of the services our stations provide Hoosiers. I'd also like to acknowledge the Department of Education. Public broadcasting has enjoyed a strong working relationship over the years with DOE, built on trust and cooperation, and we take immense pride in the public service partnership we maintain with them to enrich the lives of Hoosiers. IPBS member stations continue to provide preschool education for more than half of Indiana's children, enhance the education of tens of thousands of K-12 through students with curriculum-aligned, teacher-ready, interactive digital learning tools, and offer opportunities for adult learners from every walk of life, inside and outside the workforce. Lifelong learning is our mandate, whether it's in person, over the air, or online. In addition, we're committed to protecting the general public by providing life-saving public safety communication services for purposes ranging from early tornado and severe weather warnings to large-scale event surveillance and messaging as we did just this past May at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to school shooting scenarios. We're also dedicated to creating local content that reflects the richness of our Hoosier way of life and producing public affairs programming that equips Hoosiers with reliable facts and trusted information they need to make well-informed decisions. One example of this is the uh, program we're in the midst of producing and, and finalizing on youth mental health in conjunction with Riley Children's Hospital and a series of community dialogues that we're planning that will take place later this year across the state to provide comfort to Hoosiers and increase awareness and understanding of this very important subject. With our focus on education, public safety, and civic dialogue as the backdrop, the current state budget calls for $3.675 million to be distributed through the Department of Education in fiscal year 2024 to our nine public radio and eight public television stations. Consistent with the bill language, one-seventh of the total, or $525,000, is to be distributed equally to our member radio stations. $3,150,000 is designated for our TV stations. Finally, consistent with historical practices, we ask that the distribution be made in two allocations, 75 percent of the total coming in September 2023 and the remaining 25 percent in January of 2024. The committee members should have a letter from me detailing the proposed allocations for each station and this distribution timeline. Again, on behalf of our 17 stations, many thanks to you, the General Assembly, and the Department of Education for your partnership. We value our longstanding relationship immensely. I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions for the gentleman? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I believe next we're ready for item number six under review items uh, dealing with fines, or fees, fines, and penalties. And I believe we only have one actual agency, the State Board of Accounts. And so please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Kendra Leatherman, General Counsel for the State Board of Accounts. Uh, we're here for the Budget Committee to review 
are um, fees that are prescribed in statute. So uh, we have three fees. All of them are prescribed and authorized by statute. One is called our processing, which is formerly known as the typing fee. One is um, called our technology fee. And the last one is a technical assistance fee. Um, all of these um, have been in statute for a while. They were authorized by the General Assembly. However, in statute doesn't necessarily give an exact dollar amount of what that is. It just says it's reasonable. So we felt it was prudent to come to the Budget Committee to have those reviewed. Um, I can take any questions. All of these are based upon the cost of what this part of the audit actually requires us to perform. So for processing, it's based upon uh, the processing costs in year one, and we try to recover those costs in year two. Thank you. Any questions on those three respective fines or fees? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Presentation. Well, if I have things correct, we're at the point now where we need to approve their proposed agenda, a proposed amended agenda. Are there any motions to remove any item under the amended agenda? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the amended agenda at this point. So moved. Is, is there a second? second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes unanimous. Thank you. I believe what we have left, I just acknowledge the fact several reports have been received and those are listed of course in our, in our packet there. Any concerns, questions need to come before the committee at this point? <clears throat> uh, seeing then, I'd like to thank Purdue University for being our host and here at the Beck Agricultural Center. And uh, as I, I said last night, I'm just uh, personally proud to be a Purdue graduate and what Purdue is doing. And so thank you again for hosting us. And with no other concerns before us, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>